There we go. Hey, everybody. Uh, just a couple of you, not everyone. Just type in yes if you can hear me. I want to make sure we got audio. We are live. So my name is Andrew Kraus. I don't see anybody typing in yet. If you guys could type in yes. There we go. Okay. Thank you, Tonya. Uh, my name is Andrew Kraus. I'm the co-founder of InventRight. Stephen Key is our other co-founder. That's the term co, right? There's two, I guess. Uh, and we co-founded InventRight 20 years ago. I need to see what our anniversary date is. I think we're coming up on 21 years, so I think InventRight's going to be able to drink pretty soon. Um, anyway, that's a really bad joke, isn't it? Uh, so, uh, and we've had students in over 65 countries and our students are licensing stuff all the time. I'll let me get this other mic out of here. So it's not in the way. Um, and what we do is we coach and mentor inventors to license their products. So what is licensing? When you license your product to a big company, it's their money. You don't need to raise money. You don't need venture or vulture capital, as I call it. I grew up in Silicon Valley. I call it vulture capital. So you don't need to raise money. Um, it's their workforce. So, you know, when you license this product to a big company, and it's going to be one of maybe 80 of their products or 40 of their products or 20 of their products, um, they're going to utilize all their employees, their sales, marketing, manufacturing, accounting, um, everything, you know, to sell the product, just like as if it's one of their products, because it is one of their products, right? Um, so that's what licensing is. And then the biggest thing with licensing is you're going to tap into existing distribution. So if they're already in 30,000 stores, you're in 30,000 stores. So you're tapping into the money, the workforce, and the distribution, so you don't need to start a company. Now, in some ways, you have a company, of course, because if your business model is to license products, to major companies, that's your business. But it's a business that you could have with two to six hours a week. You could have a full-time gig. I talked to people, I've talked to, had some students that work literally 80 hours a week and they can still find the time to license. Most of you don't work that much. Um, maybe you have another business and you can keep all that. And then maybe eventually one day you wanna go pro and you wanna quit over whatever it is you're doing after you get royalties coming in for multiple projects. And, um, and do it full time for some of you. So it depends on, on the person. But um, that's what licensing is. So type your questions into the chat box. I'll get to as many as I can. We're going to be on for a full hour. So this is going to be fun. Uh, for those of you who have done this before, you guys know I like to answer questions. I talk pretty fast, which I've gotten feedback. People seem to appreciate that. They're like, I got a lot. You know, I got where I talk really slow answer half the amount of questions, right? So I try to answer as many as I can. That's just kind of naturally how I am. And most people have been saying, I've had anybody said they didn't like that. Um, so let's start off here with, with Adam. Oh, and by the way, when you type in your questions, a lot of you have handles, type in your first name to type if your name's Bob or Sally or whatever. And if not, I'll just read your handle. And sometimes they're funny or silly or nonsensical, but it doesn't matter one way or the other. Um, Adam says, hi, Andrew, when contacting a company, is it okay to email and call several people in the same company when asking permission to send your sell sheet? For example, contacting three people in the product acquisition department. Well, there's usually no such thing as a product acquisition department, um, but it is okay to contact multiple people in the same company. But when you get one person in the company that responds to you, especially if they're showing interest, stop. Don't keep contacting others. So they're your superman or superwoman. If they've gotten back to you and they've made a connection, and even if they said no, it's like that's that was that was the connection you made. Respect that. Yes, yeah, sometimes you can go around and another person in the company shows interest. We had students do that, and another person in the company shows interest, and then they show they end up in a meeting, and the other person's like, I already said no to that. And okay, maybe you have egg on your face, maybe it turns out okay, but no, don't hesitate to contact multiple people in the same company. But once you've made that connection and they're communicating with you, which you don't get with everybody, then consider them your, your, your guy or gal, your contact, okay? Um, and if they say no and then you go around them, go somebody else, that can bite you in the butt a little bit. I've had people try that and it worked out fine. Um, I remember a recent story. One of our coaches, Ryan, 
he uh, sent it to a person and it, I think it was a DRTV infomercial product. And they said, no, there's a, it doesn't make sense because there's other product, blah, blah, blah. And Ryan could see that they didn't watch the video. They had got, he sent a sell sheet. In the sell sheet was a link to the YouTube video, unlisted, of course, so only people with a link can see it. And um, he noticed that they didn't look at it. So he went and sent it to somebody else and he got interest. So that's nice. Um, and by the way, this, that's a kind of a little side tip. Uh, when you post an, un so for YouTube, we're on YouTube now. So you guys are somewhat familiar with YouTube if you're watching me right now. Um, with YouTube, you have three different statuses. You have um, a regular public YouTube video, you have a private YouTube video, and you have an unlisted video. So most people are like, well, I don't want to publicly disclose my invention, which you're absolutely right, you shouldn't. So they think, oh, I'm gonna go private. But that's a freaking mess because you need to know their YouTube username and then share it with them. And how many people working in a corporation have either memorized or even have a YouTube username? So private is not practical. Now unlisted means that nobody can see it, nobody can search for it and find it, Literally only people, it's usually a really long link, only people with the link that you sent it to can see it. So essentially it's like a password protected, like person has the link. If they share it within the company, you, you're okay with that, right? Um, you want them to share it within the company if they want to share it to their folks. But, and it's also good because to be honest with you, creating a website, go to my site, type in the username, type in the password. No freaking company is going to do that. When I see people doing that, I go, knock it off. Don't do that. That's, that's, they will not take the time. A marketing manager is going to give you about six to 10 seconds. That's it. You're making go to a website and type in a username and password. They won't freaking do it. Stupid. Do not do that. People are like, really? But I want to protect it. Okay, protect it. You know, and you call them, you got permission, you sent your sell sheet. Maybe there's a link to a YouTube video in there as well. Make it unlisted, not public, not private, but unlisted. And it's essentially it's a password of sorts because people have to have that really long ass link, you know, otherwise they won't be able to get it. Um, I swear once in a while just to get your attention. I'm not, not normally swear that much, but at all, but, um, okay. Uh, Negro said, Frez, Frazetta, um, says, how does invent right TV service cost? And what does it offer? So InventRight TV is our free YouTube channel. And we have, I think, don't quote me on this. I think it's 500 plus videos. And we give a ton of free information away. So you can check out, I'll kind of go on the levels of the way we help. So InventRight TV is completely 100% free. I've been doing, since the pandemic thing, I've been doing this for every, it used to be every Wednesday, and now I think it's every Monday. Today's Monday. No, I don't think. I know it's Monday. Um, and we've been doing these live Q&As. We won't be doing this forever. But And then we do tons of YouTube shows and all sorts of different things to do with licensing, Negro. And um, it's all about licensing, selling your ideas for royalties, not starting a business, but selling it for royalties. So you can, I joke, have delusions of grandeur because these companies are really big and they can blow something out really big. We're on your own. You're like messing around with it. You're maybe selling 2,000, 5,000 units a year where, you know, and it depends on the product guys, but you know, and this big company's selling 200,000 units a year, you know, so you can think big and I joke, have delusions of grandeur when you're licensing because they're huge. What they can do is amazing. And then you get a small royalty every unit that they sell and you get paid those royalties quarterly. So getting back to your question, Negro, um, uh, what does the service cost? So InventRight TV is free. And then we got, you got our books, Become a Professional Inventor. Our biggest one is One Simple Idea. I always get that one first. If you guys don't have any of our books, it's a yellow book, One Simple Idea. Um, and you can go to InventRight TV and get all these resources. The books, you know, like 13 bucks, 15 bucks, depends on the book. Um, and then we have a group coaching service where Tuesdays and Thursdays, for an entire hour, you're on with a group and you're getting coached as a group. And that's about 900 bucks. You can pay it over six months. And then if you step it up to the next level and you go to the one-on-one -on -one coaching, which is what most people do, it's one-on-one, -on -one, you and a coach. And I don't give you a big sales pitch and all the features of it, but just give the basics and then we'll move on back to the questions. Um, it's half a year of help. 
and you're on with the coach every single week talking to them, them talking about your product. Oh, for your product, do this, do that. This is your next step. Okay, this is your homework you did on making your list of companies or filing your PPA or making your sell sheet or, oh, the company said that, say this back. They're there for you five days a week. We don't work on weekends. Deals don't happen on weekends anyway. And you're talking to them every week and then you can email them in between. Um, coaching somebody via email is a freaking joke exclusively. Now, if your coach knows you, your strengths and weaknesses, your product, what homework they gave you to do, everything they're telling you to do, and you met with them three days ago, but you're stuck on something and you drop them an email, email coaching is great for that. But you have to talk to your coach every week. Otherwise, people get off track. So the coachings for half a year um, includes software called Smart IP to file a provisional patent, includes a sell sheet, includes a virtual prototype, includes our negotiation coach, which would be there for you to tell you what to say back to an email, tell you what to say in the next phone call. He'll get you to about 95% done. So not every deal, you'll get interest sometimes from companies that are like, oh, we decided not to move forward. That's very normal. But he'll get you to about 95% done without having to contact the licensing attorney. When the deal is 95% done, he'll say, okay, you need a licensing attorney for an hour or two to dot the I's and cross the T's. And we know one that's reliable, but that's really reducing your financial risk. A lot of people, they... They get stressed about like, oh, I can't afford a patent. And then they become very empowered by the fact that you can file a provisional patent application for $70 if you file it yourself, especially if you use our smart IP software. Um, but then they're not thinking about, oh, but what about a patent, uh, um, a licensing attorney? Those attorney's fees can really add up. So when our students are with us, we help you through the entire licensing negotiation and through the contract. We do say don't sign it. It, until you have an attorney look at look at it, a licensing attorney, but that's only on a more or less done deal. So um, just getting in one deal with one company can cost what we charge for a half year for everything, including the negotiations. So anyway, so the TV show's free, books are a few bucks, 10 to 15 bucks, most of them. Um, the the uh, academy's about 900, and then the boot camp's about 3,000. And that's both the academy and the boot camp or for half a year. Um, we found that piecemealing it, oh, a question here, a question there, it doesn't work. It doesn't get you where you need to go. If it worked, we would do it, but it doesn't work. So we don't do that. So thank you for asking that, Negro. You gave me the opportunity to a little advertisement. Sorry about that, guys. But people ask us all the time, like, I've been watching your show for a year. What do you guys do? And I'm like, I'm mentioning our students all the time. Don't you think that we're guiding people? And it's like, it's funny. I, I don't know if people think, oh, well, I'm a student because I'm watching a YouTube show. We've had people say that. They don't realize that we coach and mentor people and guide them through the whole thing. So because we don't want to do the sales pitch all the time, like I just did a little bit, because that's not really our style. That's old school. You don't want to be hard selling people all the time. Anyway, um, uh, Matt says, hi, Andrew, you said a few times that if your invention has alternatives, you need to just pick one and go for it uh, for your sell sheet. Correct. I was watching Stephen's video with Gene Quinn. Gene Quinn's a, a patent attorney. Um, Gene expressed the importance of including the alternatives in your PPA. So I understand this, but sell sheets is where I'm hung up. So you, you're right. So that's a great point, Matt. You want to include every viable variation in your PPA. And so people worry like, I'm not an attorney. I can't write a provisional. 80% of it is just including those variations. Now, as I say always on these live Q&As, don't include a version that's half as good as your invention. It's a waste of time. But if it's a version that's like 70, 80%, 90%, just as good, but not the version you're pitching, throw all that in the PPA. It only, it's, it's whatever time it takes you to write, pictures it takes you to make to illustrate those things, to get that protection in your PPA. But on the sell sheet, you need to pick one version. Sometimes there's a slight variation. You put the big invention, you put the invention as the big picture, and you have a small picture. You can say like optional. Like it's like a little feature and it says optional extra feature. But most of the time you don't even want to do that. But sometimes that's appropriate. But you can't go, here's five versions, pick one. It's not professional. You can't do that. Now, if they say no to it, you could go back and go, I have some other versions. Can I send them to you? You could do that. But don't ever initially like go, here's five versions of this thing. 
they don't have the freaking time. They have six to 10 seconds to look at it and see if they're intrigued or not. And if you overwhelm them with five versions, it doesn't look like you have your act together. So, uh, so that you expanded on the question, there are two ways to do my invention, but both solving the same problem, both would be made and function slightly different. Okay, that's fine. Long question, and I don't want it to come down to the PPA for the company to understand that I also have alternatives in mind. What to do, Andrew? Well, what I just said, you have to pick, put your best foot forward. Sometimes you can have a slight variation. You could show that. Um, you have to pick one of those two. Um, two ways of doing my invention, but solving the same problem. I, I bet you one of those is better than the other one. So send them one. If they're not interested, just say, hey, thank, thank you, you know, no problem if you're not interested. Email them right back when they say no and say, here's another version. If you're interested, uh, go ahead and reply. If you're, if you're not, then you don't even have to reply. You could, you could say that. So you're not like being pushy, you know. Um, okay. Uh, oh, well, that's a good question. Interesting. Khalid uh, says, hi, Andrew. Is it smart to send your idea to the companies who are struggling? Oh, geez, I paged up too fast there and I lost my place. Who are struggling in the market? Um, yes and no. Um, you know, I, I talked to an attorney the other day. He wasn't a patent attorney or licensing attorney or anything like that. And his business is booming. And his business was... It, they were in a lot of acquisitions. So there's a lot of um, bigger companies right now swallowing up smaller companies. So like I remember I said earlier, I kind of joked when you're licensing, you can have delusions of grandeur and you're not delusional because these big companies are so big. You know, for the most part, you want to license to medium, large and very large companies. And why wouldn't you? You know, sometimes you, you, you they don't get any interest from any of those. You settle for a smaller company and that's fine. Um, but you know, I, I don't know, Khalid, if you, how do you know the company is truly struggling? Is it like an industry that's struggling or what have you? Um, right now I can tell you I have more students in deals for August and September than we ever have, which is a trip. Now, one thing that's happening though, is these deals are taking longer. Our negotiation coach, Paul, just had a student today that licensed the product today. I just got the email a couple hours ago. Um, so what Paul is telling me, he's our negotiation coach, is the deals are taking longer, you know, which is fine. Hey, so they take longer. It takes them a little longer to make a decision. They're busy with things to get back to you. Um, and I think with some of them, I haven't actually experienced this so far with our students doing deals right now, but my guess is some of them, they'll take a little longer to launch. You know, when a company takes on your product, on average, it can vary tremendously, guys, but it can take three to nine months for them to launch the product. And then you get paid to royalties quarterly every three months. So it's over a year before you see royalties, but let's say three to nine months is typical for them to launch the product. Well, maybe now you're talking uh, four to 12 months before they launch the product because it just takes them all to put everything to production. And it really depends uh, greatly, but I think that's going to start happening too, but that's fine. Our students are like, um, hey, oh, I got that deal done. I'm going to move on to other stuff. And it takes them a little while to launch it. Great. It's their money. It's their workforce. And it's their distribution. I'm so happy I plugged my product into this monster that's going to take care of it. So um, you won't really know until they're struggling, but they will let you know. So you could be in an industry that's in some way struggling and maybe 10 companies tell you they're struggling, but this one company's rocking it. And they're like, oh, we're interested. So I, I don't think it's good to look for excuses as to why to not reach out right now. How hard is it to reach out? It's not that hard. Now, prepping to reach out is a bit of work, right? For those of you who haven't done it before, you have to make your list of companies. You have to make your sell sheet. You have to know how to reach out. You have to know how to talk to these companies. But I would still go for it, Clid. You know, but if you know a company is about to go bankrupt or something, I mean, no, that's not making any sense at all. Um, but I would still present, you know. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Jason's asking if he can use his name 
on a licensing agreement. So we always recommend to our students to always file an LLC or a corporation when you do a deal. Now, if you don't have one before, that's not a big deal because it's just one more thing to do. But when you do the deal, you should always do it under an LLC or a corporation. It just provides you an additional measure of protection. And LLCs are pretty cheap to do, guys. I mean, in some states, they're like 20 or 40 bucks where I live in Nevada. It's about 200. In California, they're like 800. Um, so some people will wait until they get into the deal and then and they don't care like, oh, well, you were, they're not going to do this. This is what people are thinking. Well, you were doing business as Bob Smith Designs before. Now you want to do it as Bob Smith LLC? No way. We're not doing that. Never, ever has that ever happened. They don't care. They just want your product. If you change your company name and you want to do it under an LLC or corporation, they could care less. I've never once in 20 years had a company complain about that. But you should do an LLC. LLC is a little bit easier to do. But that's something you need to consult an attorney about to figure out what's right for you. Um, it's funny. We get so many questions about the LLC thing on these live chats. I don't know why. Um, Tonya says, hi, Andrew. Which inventors at InventRight would be good to help get a license for a product in the beauty, hair industry, and healthcare products? Uh, I would say, just to make a point, none. Because every inventor is more interested in their product than yours. So what InventRight is all about is we coach inventor inventors so that they get that real life experience during the six month coaching program. So we want them to say at the end of six months, I have people say this too. I get it, Andrew, I don't need you anymore. I've had people say that to me. They're like, well, I don't need you guys anymore. And I'm like, Oh, okay. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. I remember that I said that's okay to say that because that's what we're all about. We're empowering people with real life experience so they can say, I get it, guys. I don't need you anymore. If I need, to, need you, I'll come back. But I can license products the rest of my life. So if our students, let's say they license three products or they're working on a product and then you're coming in there, hey, can you license this for me? Why do they want to share royalties with you if they can license their own product, keep 100% of the royalties, and they're never going to be as excited about your product as you? So my answer, Tony, is nobody will ever be as excited about your product as you, so you got to do it. And the question is, why do you think you can't? So maybe you need to watch our YouTube show more. I would buy our book, One Simple Idea. That's the yellow book. And I would become empowered and do it. And you're capable of doing it. Um, we have students that don't have a GED, don't have a high school degree, that don't, you know, have a strong business background or any business background, and they can do it. Sometimes people with no business background do a better job than people with a business background because they're like, oh, you told me to do that? Okay, I'll do it. Where somebody that has a business background is like, well, I know how to do this. It's like, no, nah, you don't know how to do licensing. Don't be so arrogant. Why don't you listen to your coach and pay attention and let's do do what they say. It's 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 gonna work. It doesn't work hundred percent of the time. I mean, nothing works hundred percent of the time. Nothing that's just you know, it, it just doesn't. Um, let's see. Rain flake sharing very something very personal. It's interesting. Uh, hi, I dropped out of university twice and sucked. At every job, my creativity prevents me from sticking to any project, although I get ideas from time to time. Um, should I work with someone persistent? Well, Rainflake, thank you for being so honest. I think, I think your problem is a problem that a lot of creative people and inventors have. Maybe you have some ADD or ADHD. You're hyper creative, but you can't complete projects and maybe focus on all the boring stuff that's not as exciting as dreaming up ideas. Um, so you either need to find a partner that's like, wow, this guy, I mean, you didn't give me your real name, so I'm just gonna keep calling you Rainflake. Um, but wow, this Rainflake guy, he's just a genius. Like he respects you, right? Or he, she respects you. He's just so creative. And then you find somebody that's not creative, but it's an animal on the phone and reaching out on LinkedIn and maybe good at marketing. A lot of creative people, percentage of them really suck at marketing too. And you find that person, you work with them. But again, hard to find people as excited about your products as you, you know, but you might be able to find that person or you, you learn how to focus. And some people literally are not capable of focusing because they have such extreme ADHD, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, or some other issues, or maybe they're like super dyslexic. And I understand that. 
But maybe that's you, Rain Flake. Maybe it's not. You know, but if not, you're going to need to find somebody to do it for you. And don't get taken by these invention scam companies. They won't steal your idea. They'll just take your money and say they'll do it for you. But, you know, if you dropped out of university twice and you sucked at every job, I don't know if you're being funny about that. Um, if you, It sounds like you might have some issues uh, with, with uh, discipline and, and organization and stuff. So as far as a job... Um, Find a job that they just want creative people. There's jobs that do that, that doesn't require you to be organized, just being hyper creative. Um, you know, so there's a place for you. There's a place for everybody. So what I, what I really like about it is that you're being honest with yourself about it. You're self-aware. And so now you just need to, to, to get some help. Um, I, I might even, um, I might even take a, like a Myers-Briggs, like, personality slash job, like figure out you, you, that will give you like the types of jobs you might be good at because with licensing, the money doesn't come in overnight. So you, I don't know if you're employed right now, or you just said you suck at every job. You didn't say you're unemployed, but um, it's always, you got to have some income coming in. You don't want to, Steven and I aren't of the get rich quick variety, like just dump everything else you're doing and risk it all and just focus on licensing your products and don't do anything else. No, have some money coming in. Be chill, have fun with licensing. And yeah, if enough money comes in, you quit your day job or your business, but don't, don't, don't quit it. You know, have money coming in. You don't need the extra stress of having no money coming in and have to license your product in the next four months or something. That's, that's messed up. Um, let's see. Sorry. Let's see. Uh, Seven thirty. Michael here. I'm a new invent rights student. I need to edit my sell sheet description that I just sent in. How do I contact them quickly? Um, so just just contact your your coach. Seven seven. Michael. I was going to call you seven thirty. Sounds like a rap star name or something. Michael, just contact your coach, and they'll put you in contact with uh, Lindsay, our design studio manager, so they can help you out. It sounds like you had, you changed what you want it to be. So reach out to your coach right away, and say, "Hey, I need to make some changes," and they'll direct you. Um, Jonathan says, "How to find a footwear manufacturer at Nike quality level?" Um, you know, I mean, it's if you have a footwear product, you're going to reach out to companies selling footwear. So, you know, to me, that's like right in front of your face. So you got some major companies, you got Reebok, you got some smaller companies, which are probably going to be more approachable. And you're just going to approach all those companies and approach a marketing manager. Um, I can tell you fashion and footwear is not the easiest um, category to license in, like clothing and footwear, very hard. Um, but that's the product category you're in. So reach out to all of them, you know, um, that are a right match. Look at their product line, see who's a right match. Um, Linda Marie, if you're able to get an endorsement from an industry commission director, industry commission director, relevant to importance of your product, would it help to include into your initial sell packet sheet video. Yeah, so essentially what Linda Marie is saying is if you if you had an endorsement from a doctor or an industry professional and you could put that in your sell sheet, would that help? Yeah. And sometimes if you have endorsements from users too, like they're people that brush their teeth or it's a dentist or whatever. So that's definitely not going to hurt. Um so yeah, I, I don't I think that's great. You can do that. Maybe it goes in your sell sheet. Maybe it goes in the email. It really depends. Um, let's see. Uh, how how lamb? Um, hi Andrew. For a big idea, I would like to be part of the licensees team to come up with the final product. Can one get paid for both the licensing as well as the work for the product design? Um, yes. That's possible. It depends on the level of involvement. If you're just like a lot of inventors, you don't have a design background, but you might. But then some of our inventors are professional product designers in that they went to school to learn industrial design or product design or they're professional engineers. And it depends on your level of involvement. 
Uh, in most cases, I would say no, and I wouldn't even bring it up. But it, in some cases, it does make sense. Um, and they could pay you for that. But, you know, just getting it out there and getting the royalties is uh, going to add up to a lot of money. But you don't want to get taken advantage of either. I've had a few of our students that are industrial designers. Those are basically people that studied industrial design in school, which is like product design. They know how to make products look pretty for a lack of a better way of saying it. Um, and, and the company kind of took advantage of them a little bit. And, and yeah, they and still li they licensed it. it was, they did the licensing deal, but it's like they just got tons. Like it started to become a full-time job for them. That's not appropriate. Um, but yeah, so it's possible. You need to figure out what's right. That's one of those things you got to kind of figure out on a case-by-case -case basis. But usually the royalties are substantial. I'd rather you just get more in the way of royalties. Um, but if it gets really, really in depth, um, yeah, it might, might, might be appropriate to get some sort of fee for your design um, help and assistance. Um, okay, so Scott, Scott says, I'm speaking with Sylvia on Wednesday. Uh, what should I expect as a goal of this conversation? Thanks for your fast reply, by the way. So uh, Scott, uh, Sylvia is one of our advisors, basically a salesperson. And um, just talk to her about where you are with things. We're really mellow. We, we don't hard sell anybody. So just talk to her where you are with things. She'll explain our boot camp program, maybe our academy program, how we work with folks. And everything is confidential you share with us. So just have a casual conversation with her. You're not going to need to make a decision on the spot or anything. And uh, just have fun with it. So don't, don't like, not any preparation required. Um, and if any of you are interested in our coaching programs, you can go to our website, click on contact us, and you can book an appointment with Sylvia or Eli. Sometimes I'm on that calendar and occasionally people will get put with me. Um, uh, Raul, hi, Andrew. Would in-house engineers at companies help with solving the mechanics and design of an idea? Absolutely. I mean, they almost always do. Um, but you need to get the basics right? And a lot of times like your change to the product is not, um, is you need to understand that part, but you don't understand the complete inner workings of this product, nor do you need to, because you're like, oh, well, they would just do it the same as they've always done it for that product over there, but they're going to put my hinge on the side over here. So you do need to understand your piece of it to a certain extent, but they can definitely help you further. But you don't want to be the ridiculous inventor that's like, I got this idea. And it's a robot that jumps up on your roof and shingles your house. So men don't need to sweat in the heat and won't fall off the roof and it'll be more affordable. And the company's like, well, how are we going to do that? I don't know, but it's a good idea. And that's a, a gross exaggeration of a ridiculous inventor coming up with this crazy ass idea with absolutely no engineering done on it whatsoever. But the vast majority of our products that our students work on, uh, you can say, well, there's that product and that product and I made this change and, and you, you, they're like, you see they're like, oh yeah. Or maybe they're like, oh, but I'm still struggling with this. And you know, even though they're an engineer and maybe you aren't, you're like, oh, well you could do it like this. And they're like, oh yeah. So staying involved is great. And yes, they're gonna figure out a lot of the, the details of the engineering. What you're really selling is the benefit of the product. So that is, again, it varies tremendously based on the product. Um, Thank you, Raul. That was a great question. Um, Saeed says, hi, Andrew. Is it okay to have multiple images on a cell sheet? Yes, it is okay, but it is a, a giant mistake that I see people making over and over again. They might have like six pictures, and they're all the exact same size. Never, ever do that. you got to have one big picture. Maybe you have a little storyboard at the bottom or a few other pictures or one small picture showing a close-up or something. There's always going to be one picture, not always, but almost always, that's bigger than all the rest. Don't have a bunch, like six pictures all the same size. It looks horrendous. Don't do that. And any graphic designer, if you're working with a graphic designer that lets you do that or thinks that that's good graphic design, you should fire them right away. Um, Uh, Timothy, hi, Andrew. What is considered confidential versus non-confidential information when submitting your ideas to prospective licensees? Do I send them my PPA if they're asking for it without an NDA? Um, 
So Timothy, I talked to a student on Friday about this. You know, companies, when they show initial interest after seeing your sell sheet, will sometimes ask for a, a PPA or ask for a prototype. I would never, ever, ever give them either. Be and it's not because you don't want them to see your PPA or you don't want them to see your prototype, but it doesn't move the deal forward. It's your great opportunity. They want something. So get on the phone with them. It's your opportunity to have a rapport, make a connection. And the fact that they take 10 minutes to talk to you on the phone shows sincere interest. Saying email us your PPA doesn't show sincere interest. Anybody can write that in two seconds. And so it's always good to get on the phone with them first. Say, hey, you know, yeah, I'd be happy to handle that at the right point in time. But I really want to, I got a few questions for you. I'm sure you got a few questions for me. Can we set up a phone call? Okay. So, yeah, and you could do, again, everything we're sharing tonight is not legal advice. So seek the services of an attorney if you're seeking legal advice. Nothing I say tonight is legal advice. Um, so it's up to you whether or not you want to ask them to sign a PPA um, to, in order to see your, sorry, ask them to sign an NDA in order to see a PPA. So for those of you that are brand new, that's a lot of abbreviations. So a PPA is a provisional patent application and an NDA is a non-disclosure agreement. Um, NDAs don't offer the protection that you guys think they do. If you think like, oh, that's just solid <laughs> bullshit. Any attorney that tells you that, not saying you don't have people sign them, but don't think it's some like Iron Man kryptonite protection. Um, have I ever had a student send an NDA or not send an NDA and get ripped off by a company and steal their idea? No, never in 20 years. Could it happen? Yes. So, you know, what can happen and what happens often is very different. Now, I talk to too many inventors that aren't our students that tell me stories about getting ripped off. And when I dig deeper, I realize they didn't get ripped off. It was their paranoia. But sometimes I'm like, oh, wow. And then they tell me what they said. And they said whacked ass stuff. Again, swearing to get your attention. They said some whacked ass stuff to the company. And the company got really wrapped up in it. And they're like, this inventor is crazy. Well, screw them. I'm going to go around them. Never had that happen to an invent right student. Because our students would never say stuff like that. So even though I say that I've never had one of our students take it, our students are conducting themselves professionally. They know how to evaluate companies. They know what to send and when. They know how to not say wacky stuff. And so, but I, this is what I think has happened before to non invent right students that I've talked to. I don't think, I know. Company shows interest. They start moving forward. Company even like makes a prototype, gets quotes, gets all wrapped up in and all excited. And then some crazy ass inventors like, well, what are you looking for? And, you know, those conversations could have happened early. Oh, I want a half a million dollars. Uh, Okie dokie. You know, I mean, you could easily earn half a million or more in royalties over time. But asking for that all up front when they're taking all that risk is a complete and rookie move. And then I've talked to people that, oh, well, then they went ahead and did it without me. You know, and they went around my patent or whatever. It's because you said stupid stuff. Doesn't mean it's okay for them to do that. Not saying that. But invent rights students would never do that sort of thing. They would have done a licensing deal. Okay, you're going to get, I'm, I just want a small royalty per unit. As you make money, I make money. I'm like, oh, this person's level-headed. Not, oh, my God, we've invested 10000 in this, and now this whacked-ass inventor is asking for, asking for a half million dollars up front, and then they're yelling at me when I say no? Like, what, what's going on there? So I don't think you guys, just the fact that you spent the time to listen to me for an hour here or 40 minutes so far, you're probably not in that group, but there are inventors doing that stuff and they're making all you guys look bad. Um, let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. So Tom, boy, this is a hard name. It's a cool name. Tonanson. Tanenzin? I have no idea how to pronounce that. Tanenzin. Tanenzin. I, I know I butchered that. Sorry. Um, can we use Smart IP software with Academy? Yeah, actually, when you join the Academy, it includes the Smart IP software, which you can also buy separately for 99 bucks, but it, it's included with the Academy. Tanenzin. 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 I think I got it now. 
I probably still don't have it, but um, if you sell, if you send me a phonetic pronunciation, if you can write that out, Tanantazin, hopefully later, maybe I can read it just for my own curiosity on how to pronounce that. Um, so what would you say to an independent product developer? You have an interesting way of spelling, Michael, that has a great idea, but hasn't made it to the market, but his competitor has found out a bit about it and found ways to work around his designs and is already on the market. Okay. Well, first of all, why did your competitor find out about it? When you're licensing, everybody isn't a competitor. They're all a potential partner, right? Everybody is doing similar products. Now, if you're venturing and selling it yourself, okay, they're all competitors, right? So my question to you, Michael, is did, did you send it to somebody that was a potential licensee? I mean, you said they want to they want to work around it. I don't know. And it's already on the market. Um, did they really take your idea or did you just think they did? Um, how did they find out about it, about you? Did you post it up on websites? If so, why did you do that? When you're licensing, don't publicly disclose anything. Maybe you were looking to venture it, sell it yourself. In that case, okay. But why did you put it up before you were ready to sell it then? Um, so what I would say is, Go First of all, it sounds like you're saying they worked around what you did. So go ahead and license what you have. And how well is their product selling? Is it selling well because they're a great company? Is it not selling well because they're not a great company? They don't know how to market it, don't have the marketing money or the money, and you still think your idea has legs? Um, and go ahead and produce it. Uh, go ahead and show it to a bunch of other potential licensees and license it. Don't think twice about it. So obviously there's more stuff to get into there, but um, uh, Gray, Gray Zinnia, um, is it possible to license products, a product to day logic of Rite Aid? Rite Aid, as you guys know, is a um, drugstore in the United States or or do they make their own products? So, you know, I, I don't know who DayLogic is, but there are um, retailers that have their own house brand. And usually retailers like Rite Aid or Walmart or Target, when they have a house brand, it's to reduce cost and cut out the middleman on generic items, like a chair, a towel, various things. Rite Aid has generic, uh, versions of some um, medications and things. And so usually it's changing a little bit, but retailers that have their own house brand, sometimes you won't know, you can look it up, who owns such such brand and you're like, oh, that's a Walmart brand. I didn't know, because they don't put Walmart on it. They have another name, right? Because that's kind of has a stigma of being cheap. Oh, that's just a house brand. So they kind of give it another brand. Um, so, it's usually those house brands, they're just trying to reduce costs on generic items. And they're not looking to do innovative products. So if you look at all of Rite Aid's house brands and you look at all the products, it's all generic stuff. Well, they don't want to do an innovative product. That's not what they do. So license it to one of their vendors that do do innovative products. Okay. So, um, but it is possible. And, you know, there's like Target. I think they have some house brands that are kind of like fun, cool stuff. So that is changing a little bit. But for the most part, you're not going to license to a house brand for a major retailer. Um, but I would try it. You'd have to, it doesn't know what, doesn't, not going to hurt. Uh, uh, Jack uh, Nicholstein, love you guys. Still working on stuff. I'm just spread, spread thin right now. Well, Jack, you know, companies will always be here. Your ideas aren't going away. Um, yes, there's the possibility that somebody comes up with the same invention while you're being busy, but that's usually doesn't happen that often. It does happen to inventors. But so don't stress. Just do things in your own time. But at some point, kind of start to push a little harder. Sometimes that means somebody joins our coaching or maybe you're doing it on your own and you're like, hey, 
I'm going to put aside two hours, three hours, whatever it is. I'm going to work on my projects, goddammit, and I'm going to get this stuff done. And, and so most inventors, when they're learning how to license, they don't literally set aside the time. Tell your friends and family, hey, for these two hours this week, I'm doing this. Don't bother me. Right now, if you don't know what you're doing, two hours can be a complete and utter waste of time. You know, so watch our YouTube show, learn more about licensing, read our books and maybe get our coaching. But um, know what you're going to do for those two hours, because otherwise you just spend maybe the first hour and 45 minutes going, I don't know what I'm going to do. And then you guess as to what you're supposed to do. And then you do it for the other 15 minutes. Go, OK, I'll do that next week or I'll do that tomorrow. And your guess is wrong. And then you spend another four hours doing that, but that was the wrong order. You don't even need to do what you thought you needed to do. So make sure you know what you're doing, at least somewhat, by watching our show, reading our books, or being a coaching student of ours, and then take action. But most inventors make a lot of assumptions with regards to what you need to do in your licensing, and most of them are incorrect. Licensing is not rocket science, guys. But it's not what you think it is quite often. So watching our show, reading our books, doing our coaching will help you get on the right track. Um, even, even people that are big fans of our YouTube show that become our students, uh, quite often they even meeting with their coach every week. If they weren't meeting with their coach every week, they would start to get off track. I've seen some students that won't meet with their coach. We always almost insist they meet every week, but I see, damn, they didn't meet with their coach for two and a half weeks. And I talk to them and they're like off on their thinking already. So even with that kind of micromanagement, sometimes I see people get off track. So verify with somebody that knows what they're doing and has licensed products before, you know, that you're on the right track. Uh, let's see. Michael, when you have more than one idea, would it be smart to give them multiple ideas to license to a company to give them plenty of options to work with? Or would you say do just one at a time, even though first to market is key? You have more than one idea that would be smart to give multiple ideas to a licensing company. So when you're submitting to a company, always, always, when you don't know the person in the company, always only submit one product. Okay. Now, when they say no, because you know you submit to 25 companies, if 23 say no and two are interested, that's normal, okay? So when they say no, because a bunch of them will say no, say, oh, no problem. I realize it's the right match for you. Are you open to receiving more? And if so, is it okay if I send you multiple at the same time? Or just say, are you open to receiving more? And they say, yeah, sure, just email me. And they say, is it okay to send multiple or should I just send one at a time? You want to ask. So I don't know if that answers your question, Michael, but uh, never like with a new company or in, it's not a company, it's the person, the new person, marketing manager, the company you never reached out to before. Don't go sending them six ideas. That's wacky inventor territory. Do not do that. Send them one. Let them say no. I know sometimes they'll say yes. Let them say no and ask if you can send more in the future. And if they said yes to the first one, and they reply to you, they'll probably say, sure. I mean, I would think that 95, 98% of them will say, sure, um, send more. Uh, and then if they're like, oh, yeah, you could send multiple at the same time, then go ahead and do that. Um, uh, Jonathan, hey, guys, I have a COVID-19 related product invention with a prototype, um, something that we all need today. What company can I go to? Well, it's just like when you make your list of companies, Anytime, uh, Jonathan, you have to make a look, take a look at the companies making those types of products that are currently in the stores where you want to be. And that's your list. It's just that simple. Um, uh, Gavin, after initial interest, are there any baby steps conversations that help me land the term sheet and get a company there sooner? I know you talk about interviewing the company uh, early. Thanks. Um, yeah, Gavin. Um, just getting on the phone with them and getting them to talk to you about the product is the baby step you want to take. So just the fact that you got them on the phone. And one of the things, I, I guess I'll, I'll talk about some of the most important things you're trying to accomplish on that first call. You're accomplishing you're not some whacked out inventor. You're, oh, he's pretty easy to talk to. Okay. You know, like you're, you're not saying things like, well, well, it's got to be purple. And if you make it pink, I'm not doing a deal with you guys. Nobody's going to say that. But 
you know, they want to know that you're easy enough to, to talk to. It's very important to them. Sorry, I lost my, there we go. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, get them talking about the product. Get them feeling like involved. Like they took 10 minutes to talk to you. So you're kind of pulling them into your world and they're pulling you into theirs and they've made some sort of commitment. Once people start to commit to, to uh, do something, that's a good thing. That's so key. That's why you don't want to send your provisional or your, or your prototype. You know, you, you want to get that going. Talk to them. How does it fit in with your product line? What do you like about it? Is there any concerns you have? You know, what are, ask them. They quite often don't know because, but what are the next steps? What will we do next? You know, that sort of thing. So um, just getting on the phone is, is key. And, and don't share a royalty rate or anything like that. I mean, I could have get a laundry list of stuff, but just get on the phone with talk to them about the product. That should be pretty natural for you. And don't feel like you're ever going to get it all done on that first call. This is the way licensing works when you get interest. It's like a phone call, five or six emails, a phone call, four or five emails, another phone call, three or four emails. That's how doing a licensing deal works. If you're under the perception that you're going to get some sort of deal or a term sheet on that first call, you're running that call all wrong. Absolutely. That's why in addition to a licensing coach, when our students are with us, um, we have a uh, uh, negotiation coach and it's dicey with those discussions and he preps you before every call tells you how to respond to every email and we have a special a specialist our licensing coach Paul and he's really good at that so because it is more dicey um, let's see uh, da, 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 da. Uh, Gloria says, what is the best way to find a coach? Well, just go to InventRight and book an appointment, talk to an advisor, and we'll get you a coach, Gloria. We have 10 coaches, and they're all employees, and uh, they all work for us. None of them are contractors, and everything's confidential. We don't take a percentage. So go to InventRight.com and click on the Contact Us page, book an appointment. You'll be booked with Sylvia or Eli. Talk to them about the program, and we'll get you a coach. Um, Michael says, what would you say to someone that has their idea concept stolen and is watching companies come up with similar ideas, but they have yet to make it to the market, even though they've taken the proper steps? I don't know what that means. Um, so first of all, I, I find it very rare that companies are stealing inventors' ideas. I just It's very rare. What would you say to someone that has their idea concept stolen? Well, first of all, how, was it stolen? Or did you come up with it and not show it to anybody and somebody else then started selling it and you consider that stolen? What do you consider stolen? I don't know what that means. Um, so that's what sometimes people consider stolen. I talk to inventors like, well, I showed this idea to a company and then three weeks later they came out with it. And I'm like, there is no company on the face of the planet can launch a product in three weeks. They did not steal your idea, dude. They, you, you showed it to them. You didn't notice they had a similar product. Then it came out. No company can launch a product in three weeks. So that's one thing I get. Sometimes people are like, oh, well, they stole my idea. I'm like, well, did they, did they scan your brain to pull it out of your head? Now, other times, maybe they did. Maybe you showed it to them and then they later stole your idea. I don't see that happening to event rights students. So the question is, Michael, why is that happening to you? Like, what are you doing wrong? You could always get a provisional patent. Another great form of protection that wards up people off is to put patent pending on it. For a $70 provisional patent, you can legally write patent pending on there. They don't, there's uncertain. They can't see what you filed. When you filed it, they can see nothing. And they're like, oh, we don't want to take that risk. For that small three or four percent might consider knocking you off um that you wrote and you're watching them i think you're making this up michael in that you th this is a you're not making it up this is a fictitious scenario maybe and you didn't say that and you're watching companies come up with similar ideas companies more than one and they have yet to make it to market okay why not maybe it can't be manufactured or manufactured reason price um to make it to market how okay even though they've taken the proper steps I, I i don't know what the question is michael but just generally uh, if you want to clarify maybe i can answer it in more detail 
I, I tried. Um, uh, huh. Uh, Stefan, this is an interesting question. Hi, Andrew. Have you noticed an improvement on the initial licensing contract the company sends over after having several IR students licensed with them? Yeah, we had one company that like, it was crazy. This isn't normal because they were a new company and they're getting up and running with a lot of new products. 12 of our students licensed this one company. That was absolutely crazy. Now there was another company, the really big company. And, um, a lot of our, our students have got interest with them and license to them. And every time they send the same crappy contract. Now, every time our negotiation coach will tell our students what they need to tell the company, what needs to be changed. And every time they change like 95% of what we're recommending the student change. But then another student gets interest, same crappy contract. So they're basically like, well, if we can get away with all this stuff, we would rather get a leg up, but oh, if the inventor knows what they're doing and they're asking to change this stuff, okay, that's reasonable, we'll change it. So, um, uh, so you know, for the most part, I think, I think our negotiation coach that's right on top of things would be a better one to answer that. So, but I've seen companies, because I used to do the negotiations, um, where they just keep sending the same contract and then they're okay with changing the same stuff. And we kind of know what they're okay with changing and not changing. So it makes it really easy for a negotiation coach. Um, and then, and then other times I, I have seen them make some changes to it. Um, but it doesn't really matter. Um, it's just change more, change less. Um, I, one thing that you, you'd be surprised by guys is <sighs> these licensing contracts we get from companies aren't even licensing contracts half the time. They're, if they're written by a licensing attorney, most licensing attorneys know how to write a licensing contract. But quite often, there's general counsel in the company or the corporation, and they will write the licensing contract, but it's like a joke. Like, it's like, this isn't even a licensing contract. It looks, it's ridiculous. It's either like super short or super long, and it doesn't have all the major components of a licensing agreement. We don't care. So we know how to advise the student on what everything is critical that needs to be in there. And we work with whatever they send. We always, when we work with our students, we always get asked the student to get the company to send their contract. And our negotiation coach works with it and go, well, here are five major things need to be changed. Here's four things need to be missing. Students say, are they trying to screw me? Nah, it's just normal stuff. You know, and sometimes it's more of a mess than other times. We work with whatever is sent. It's a mess if you try to force your contract on them. Sometimes you have to do that if they insist that they don't want to come up with one. Um, but uh, what? so what I'm trying to say is we get so many god-awful contracts, but they're totally willing to work with and go, okay, yeah, okay, that makes sense. The ones that are painful are not the ones that send messy contracts. The ones that are painful are the companies that have never done a licensing deal before. So now you as the inventor, us behind the scenes guiding you, need to educate them. Like they argue about this point that is non-negotiable. And you need to make your point and then they argue a little more, make the point again. They're like, well, okay, fine. You know, but lower minimum guarantees or whatever it is. And then they finally give in. And so we found that you come back and it's kind of hard for them to to argue after we've given you the argument and they're like, Oh God, we're just going to look really unreasonable. They're right. You know, so educating a company has never done a licensing deal before is painful, painful, but you're like, you look at the company, like, it's a great company, you know, and it's huge. Like let's endure the pain. Um, but as opposed to a company that has a standard contract and has done 15 licensing deals before, now, they could be difficult, too, in that they, they're like, no, nope, that's our standard contract. And we're like, well, but this and this is unacceptable. And here's why. But we'll give on this or what have you. So they can be difficult. Most people are somewhere in between. They're not had never done a deal before. They haven't done 20 licensing deals. They're somewhere in between. We just got to fix up the contract and everybody moves forward and they're, they're happy. But there is some back and forth there. The licensing negotiation with the contract is not as important as initial interest, that initial interest getting to the contract, way more important than the contract. 
Because that's when they're deciding if they want to do the product. Does this make sense? Can we sell it? Is the marketing right? Can we manufacture this? Can we manufacture a reasonable price? Way more important. Everybody's like, well, yeah, they're going to show interest. They're going to send me a term sheet or a contract like after the first call, right? No, that's not how it works. So occasionally it happens that way. We roll with it. If it happens that way, that's fine. But there's a bunch of stuff that you need to have discussions you need to have. You do not want a licensing attorney to have those discussions. They'll rack up a bunch of billable hours, say they're fighting for you, piss the company off, and they'll still send you a bill. Our negotiation coach, Paul, is a lot more level-headed. He's He knows the flow of how all this works. And he's not trying to rack up billable hours because we don't charge our students for more any more money for helping them with 10 negotiations if they got interest from 10 companies. And so, and then when a deal is about 95% done, we say, okay, have a licensing attorney dot the I's and cross T's. And usually what we'll do is we'll advise, um, we'll say to the company like, oh, you know, why don't you change this? And them and their attorney will change it. And it just flows better that way. And then when our students get that experience, we want them to be able to do that. They know all the major deal points. They tell them and the company what needs to be changed. Maybe they agree, maybe they don't. You have maybe a bit of a debate. And, and, and then you go from there. So people don't understand. That's how licensing works. Um, if we, every time one of our students got interest from a company, if we sent you to a licensing attorney, instead of sending you to Paul, our negotiation coach, and this isn't a, a fact, okay, this is my guess, 80% of the deals that we would close, they would kill because they just don't go about it in the right way. There's this whole discussion that happens before you get to the contract. They have no freaking idea how to talk about manufacturing or how to kind of guide the um the 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 marketing manager to go to the right direction they're go you, quite often what you're doing in a licensing negotiation is the company and the individual is trying the marketing manager is trying to take it this way and you're going to take it this way so you kind of half answer their question you take it this way and they're not even talking about what they brought up before people are like i can do that i'm like yeah you're not being rude you're kind of redirecting the conversation it doesn't always work but you want to try to get it going you want to try to kickstart if it's kind of stalling you know, and you want to hold back other times when you're like, oh, they made it clear. This is what they need to do now. So I'm going to hold back. I'm not going to be pestering them every other day, you know, and we guide people to do these things and we know when to do what. And a new inventor that's never done a license deal has no clue. And they're doing all wrong. They're irritating the person and that's not good. So. Uh, do, do, do. Yeah, Jack. Jack wrote, I have had companies that come out with similar products that I have come up, thought up, right? And so instead of being discouraged by that, they're not ones you showed, Jack, but um, that's what I'm assuming he's saying. You should go, damn, I keep coming up with ideas. I don't do anything with them. And then I see them in the marketplace. It should validate to you that you're a good inventor when you see that sort of thing. And that happens to a lot of inventors. And I, we have a lot of inventors that will finally sign up with our coaching because they see that happen over and over. Like, I got to finally do something with my invention. This is getting ridiculous. You know, and they're, they're irritated by it. Whatever motivates you to get going with your product on your own or with us is a good thing. And sometimes it's kind of a somewhat what you might perceive as negative. I think it's a positive thing. Should be um, anyway. Uh, uh, Melanie said, what are the average attorney's fees for a licensing agreement review? You could easily spend three or four K with a licensing attorney, but we know a licensing attorney that for simple products, if our negotiation coach, Paul helped the student with it, and it's to that 95% done point. And I can't say this is always the case, but he'll typically review an entire licensing agreement for $350, which is nothing, nothing, but he's only doing that for our students because Paul's like, um, this is good. And they're just, he's going through the minutia of the contract. But if you, if you get interest on your own and you approach a licensing attorney to go, oh, help me close this deal. Never do that, by the way. They, a licensing attorneys are not deal closers. There might be a few of them out there that are, but by and large, uh -uh. Um, they'll easily charge you three, four, five K. Could easily be that. We charge 3K for entire six months of help, including negotiations, a sell sheet, virtual prototype, smart IP to follow your provisional and negotiation coach and all that. So we're a lot more affordable and we do a lot more and we do things to help you get to a negotiation. You're not even going to need a licensing attorney if you don't, if your sell sheet sucks or your list of companies is all wrong or your marketing's all wrong. 
you know, and, and, you know, and all that. So you got to do the right things to get interest from a company. That's more important. Um, Oh, Melanie wrote, wow, and this is why I'm a student. Thank you for the clarity on the pricing. Yeah, so um, that's cool. Oh, Melanie said, thank you for the endorsement, Melanie. Melanie said, it's 3K that you can pay monthly, so it doesn't hit that hard, highly recommended. Yeah, even if you're paying over six months, you're still paying around 3K, so keep that in mind. Um all right, guys, we, we hit the hour. We went about uh, six minutes over. I think I delivered on talking fast and answering as many questions with you guys giving me feedback that you love that, where I'm not talking like a snail, where instead of answering 10 questions, I'm answering 40 or something. I, I have no idea how many I answered, actually. Um, I don't know if I had to guess. How many questions did I answer, guys? Maybe 20, 15, something like that. I have no idea. Anyway, um, I will be back here next Monday. So I want to remind you guys to take care and keep inventing. Watch the YouTube show. Please do me a favor. Subscribe to the channel, even if, you know, and that, that helps us out. And give a thumbs up on this video, on all our videos. Highly appreciate that. But make sure to subscribe. More people subscribe, the better. Um, and I remind you guys, take care, keep inventing, and we will catch up with you next time. See you guys.